this crowd rises to its feet. But Carl slammed it home. Garland left wing, free ball. Perfect. Garland part of the lane, locked the Mobley, pow. And Allen blocked the shot at the rim. Pow with the left hand and a foul. Welcome to the Chase Down Podcast, part of the Cavs Media Family. I'm your host, Justin Brown. The Chase Down is presented by Fubo, the official streaming partner of the Cavs. Watch over 350 channels of live sports and TV, including Bally Sports Ohio, without cable. There's no cost and no commitment. Try for free at FuboTV.com slash Cavs. The Cleveland Cavaliers are coming off a loss to the Miami Heat. Our apologies for not going live after the game. Was expecting it. Things came up. It happens. You know, it's, it's roll- funny because I, I feel like I look like a coward, you know? Uh, <laughs> I just had a I just had a dinner that would that ran really long and I, I wasn't able to watch the game closely enough and uh and didn't and by the time I would watch it, it would be like eleven o'clock. So uh my bad. Uh we weren't we weren't running from the grind. We weren't running from the say, L. I appreciate your honesty, I appreciate your transparency. The problem is, Carter, this podcast we are doing on March twenty first, twenty twenty four is our seventh year anniversary. We have been doing the Chase Down podcast for seven years. And the thing is, our listeners have seven years worth of your behavior. And they know that you were ducking last night's game. They know that you don't watch the games to begin with. So what does it matter that you're at dinner? What, what's what's the deal, man? <laughs> it's, it's a great point. Um, <laughs> you know, in the end, and, uh, you know, the horrors of being known uh, are, really, are really present uh, right now. Um, but no, uh, let, let me just tell you, I had an elite meal at Chapman's, uh, in Columbus. If you, if you're a Columbus native, you gotta go. I think it's the best, best restaurant in Columbus and, uh, had a lovely evening with my dad and, uh, you know, I won't, I apologize for nothing, Justin. Shout out to A-Rod. Shout out to the man. I, I went through kind of a wave of emotions because one, I just didn't have a lot of gas yesterday. So I, I was, I welcomed the excuse to not podcast, but I was like, man, this is, this is going to turn out to be a, a nice little win here. This is uh, <laughs> it was they're, looking they're showing... like it. Yeah. I, I went through the full roller coaster of emotions. And by the end I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm, I actually, rather than feeling relief, I was like, the thought in my mind was, man, they're going to think we're ducking this result. But <laughs> but uh, I do think, uh, you know, before we get into kind of the listener mailbag, because we did ask uh, for some questions for this podcast, shout out to our Discord for coming through uh, with that. We, we should talk about the Miami loss because I think there's a lot of interesting things that happened. Uh, obviously, no Tyler Hero or Bam Adebayo for Miami. Uh, Cavs still without Donovan Mitchell, Max Drews. Can I, t- can, I t- can I tell you something? Uh, I was getting really grumpy. Like, I can't believe we're going to lose this when they don't have Hero or Adebayo. And I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're missing two of our three best players, too. <laughs> well, it's funny. They had an extensive injury list. Uh, Duncan Robinson, obviously, uh, out as well for them. Uh, Kevin Love wasn't playing. Um, but somehow, the Cavs managed to be missing more starters than the Miami Heat, which is really impressive. But it was a game that the Cavs could have won. It, it was a game that they did what should've they needed to maybe do. Maybe should have, you know? I, I think that's fair to say. Uh, you know, Isaac Okoro uh, fouling Terry Rogier on that three. Uh, just even though it wasn't a landing space uh, foul, it just a little too aggressive. Got to kind of recognize the situation there. Um, and then Terry Rozier does what he does in Cleveland seemingly every time he plays here, which, which is continue to hit those kind of tough shots um, while the Cavs went cold down the stretch. I, I thought overall... I'm, oh, let me tell you something. I'm scared of Terry. He is scary, Terry, to me at this point. This guy has been ripping our heart out for like five straight years. And, and frankly, he hasn't come up enough in our conversations about who you want to play in the first round. Which teams do you, are you most fearful of? Uh, Terry Rozier giving us a uh, apparently needed reminder of what he does uh, anytime he's playing in Cleveland. Um, but I, I thought it was an interesting game. Um, I thought the Cavs' composure earlier in the game could have been better. Uh, they clearly felt that you know the game wasn't being called the same way, and I thought that that kind of in- impacted the way that they approached um the game like the three technical fouls um you know just not being as aggressive on the defensive end like i i thought they let the whistle impact their aggressiveness and how they played defensively which you really can't do you 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 got to kind of do what miami does which is all right you don't agree with it you're going to keep playing your style um because the, the rest are eventually going to adjust to that 
you know, we favorably compared Cavs culture, especially when they were beat up uh, in January and February. Um, and it's important that you specify when they were beat up because they've been beat up all year. But, uh, uh, you know, to, to that, you know, figure figure out how to win. Don't let that kind of adversity kill you. But I do still think, you know, uh, something about this freaking Miami team, man. Uh, they they just happen to, like, go and pat, you know, go and sense LeBron left <laughs> the, the first time. They just, there's something about them that just is so steadfast and, uh, they just kind of keep coming. They just hit every timely bucket when you're playing them. And, you know, they, they execute really, really well. Um, and, you know, to you, to your point, the Cavs did, at, you know, executed everything wrong at every level down the stretch of mm-hmm. that game. Uh, and, you know, I think that you got to hold that, um, you know, yeah, Isaac fouls, uh, Rogier and then the Cavs burn one of their two, two remaining timeouts challenging it they lose that challenge now they're down to one they have right. they have to take a timeout to advance the ball on one of the other possessions and then they have zero to advance the ball down three trying to come back uh they they go they go for you know yet another two down three and not even a quick one um and i think probably now is my time to 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 go back to the the well on this one um you know, I don't know. It's it's impossible to know unless it was asked about post game, and I, I have no clue. It's impossible to know whether the 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 going for two down three at the end of games is is a is a coaching kind of demand or or uh, or, or something. Players are just reading the situation, and you know they're having a hard time generating a clean look from three. But like, I think I've seen it happen. What feels like four or five times this season. And I just, I just don't agree. Oh, and mm-hmm. with 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 the with the decision making, you know, to burn, you know, fourteen fifteen seconds on that last possession and then end with 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 a layup is without any timeouts is just it's just not it, you know I'm I just don't agree. Uh, in yeah. the end. Once um, the clock runs down to that point, you're almost better off forcing up a three. Like if you're going to go quick and you got you know, 12, 14 seconds left. That's a, a little bit different of a calculus, but even then the, the points you've brought up in the past about the foul game, I were correct. It did and, seem. And, yeah. And yeah. by the way, without timeouts, even if you take the quick two, like you still have to burn time to get the ball up the court and then yeah. they'll foul you on, you know, you have less of a chance to, you know, inbound and quickly shoot and go up with a shooting motion right off the bat. Like, I just feel like the process is not yielding success, you know? I think I, I, I think that layup functionally killed any chance they had to win. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think a 40, you know, and, and which, you know, I, I actually loved what they ran on the inbound to end the game uh, where they, they pitched it to Jarrett who high-pointed it and then tossed it back to Darius. I thought that was actually one of their better plays in that spot all year, but... Yeah. Like, you know, it's just the, the margin of error is so thin. And, like, I really do just think, like, worst comes to worst, you just take a step back, you know, 30-footer. Uh, yeah. And and, it, and it, you're just going to yield a better... Your your points per possession for the remainder of the game, I think, is just going to be higher. Yeah, and I think from a basketball philosophy standpoint, I agree with you. Um, it, it didn't seem like it, in this p- particular game that they got what they wanted out of that possession. Uh, Darius inbounded to Karras. Uh, he was calling for the ball back, didn't get the ball back. I actually thought in terms of kind of late game process and execution, this was one of Darius's better closing stretches. Um, he got blitzed the one time. Um, I think it was like with three, maybe four minutes left and had his one lone turnover for the game where he didn't see it coming quick enough and, and Jared was in there for the outlet just yet um but against a miami defense that has length that throws so many things at you the fact that he didn't have any of those turnovers in kind of those last two minutes only one turnover on the game um like that's a team that forces and generates a ton of turnovers um i thought he generated good clean looks consistently throughout the stretch uh found yang a bunch of times uh didn't yep. convert all of them but you know, one of those passes had perfect timing and the Yang was able to attack the closeout, get to the free throw line, had that nice dish to Jarrett. I thought 
closing game Darius against Miami was, was very very strong and I would have liked to have seen him get the ball back there even if it's not to take the shot I, I just thought his ability to you know whether it's to, to get himself going or get others going I would have liked to see that um, but from a philosophy standpoint I completely agree with you um, it, it's tough because I, I feel like on the night Karras was much more of a positive than he was a negative um they really struggled you know Miami's going to throw a zone at you they're going to do a lot of things to make you uncomfortable Cavs really struggled to get rim pressure uh early on in this game really and the I story thought, of the post all-star break if we're if we're calling a spade a spade yes 100 percent uh you know Darius hasn't been as efficient uh finishing inside the arc obviously no Donovan uh has had a uh, an impact on that Evan Mobley we don't talk about it enough his ability to kind of change the geometry uh, of a defense and generate rim pressure. Um, so I thought Karras came in and he really did a good job with that, you know, setting up Jared Allen, getting uh, other guys involved. I thought he did a terrific job of that, you know, 16 points, 12 assists, five rebounds, three stocks, um, just overall a solid night. But I thought in the fourth quarter, in those last couple minutes in particular, there was just possessions that I just didn't like the process from him. Obviously, uh, dribbling out the shot clock w was high on that list and, and the final possession was up there so just wasn't the execution that you wanted well you it's look funny. at and i'm, yeah, I'm sorry cool. to interrupt but you look at the the game they won where the Cavs, uh you know and i get why you might say karis take it because darius's isolations haven't been going particularly well um no. a, as of late but like you look at the game they they just won and you win on a darius jarrett pick and roll that turns into a slip that finds Isaac Okoro cutting baseline. Like, even if teams are switching, running an action with, you know, the two best players on the floor yielded you a good result because, you know, you don't just have to yield to a switch. I think that's an important thing to note. You don't just have to go, well, they switched, so now I have to try to beat someone else off the dribble and we wasted time. Like, no, you can slip. You can do all sorts of things um, uh, to, you know, you can reject and have the two guys run into each other. Like, there's a lot of roads up the mountain, uh, that you can take uh, offensively. And I just kind of felt feel like they just didn't believe in that. They just kind of, again, I think the process was poor. And um, uh, and, and that's just disappointing, man. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough to lose a game. It's tough to lose multiple games the same way. You know, I think that's, mm -hmm. I think that's why I'm so disappointed in that layup, you know, to end the game. Because, like... Or not, you know, the the second to last possession, because it's just it's just happened more than once, you know, and mm -hmm. I just don't think it's bearing fruit for them. And ultimately, again, we want to be process over results, guys. Um, yeah. And I really do think that even if uh, whoever they I forget who they fouled, I think it was Rogier uh, at the end after that Niang layup, even if he bricked both free throws, I wouldn't like the process because most of the time you're going to foul their best free throw shooter who gets the ball on the inbound. They're going to hit two and you're just going to be back right where you were, uh, with a new strategy that says foul up three. Um, yeah. so like, I, I just, I think that's why I, I was frustrated by that loss. Cause I just didn't think that, the right choices were made and there are plenty there's plenty of mitigating factors here i don't know if you saw the stat that the Cavs had the worst game from the left corner in the entire nba this season they went one for 12 on left oh corner goodness. threes um worst percentage uh game in the league uh from, from that spot uh, i think uh coop nba uh tweeted that one um so like you know there 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 is mitigating factors there is still make or miss league stuff there is you know you know scary terry going absolutely nuts uh, he had a couple bonkers threes, not including the the four point play. But like yeah. again, you you control yeah, like, what you I, can Isaac control. Isaac was making him work. Right? Yeah, Isaac was making him work, and unfortunately for Okoro, this is a, a few you know mistakes that he's had kind of a, in these moments. Uh, you know, obviously the the stepping out of bounds one against Phoenix, and I think uh, forgot about another, that one. That was tough. There was there was another time where I think he slipped a screen and would have had an open layup and kind of fumbled it out of bounds instead. And, and then, you know, obviously this foul, but I thought overall he really made Terry work on the night. I would have liked to see more from him though, in terms of, you know, impact in the game, like one assist, one rebound. I understand it's kind of the like, old Isaac uh, game, you know, a, a little bit. Yeah. It, it, you know, 
the the efficiency wasn't bad but the volume was so low that you like you don't really care one way or another and i understand like when you the Cavs aren't able to get rim pressure and they're not able to really kind of get Miami into rotation, it can become harder for Isaac to get involved in those games, right? Like That's there's fair. less of those there's less of those opportunities to cut. There's less of uh, you know, him all the kind of little things that we've liked from this season. But I still think in these type of games, you'd like to see him crash the glass a little harder. Miami's not the biggest team, you know, generate opportunities for yourself in that those ways. I think there was one kind of tip out that he had late game to Darius that was great, but I, I felt like we could have felt his impact a little bit more in those spots. Um, but, you know, ju just one of those notes. Um, I thought Jarrett uh, overall had obviously had a pretty great game, uh, 25 and, and 20, uh, three assists. Um, there, there were moments that were weird. Like, you know, he had the, the two kind of back-to-back -back turnovers. One, luckily, uh, Terry missed it. I think the, the second one Terry hit, uh, where, where he just passed it to them directly kind of in the, the backcourt, which, you know, can't happen. Um, but uh, I, I thought overall on the night, especially once Karras started generating that rim pressure, he, he was the kind of dominant force that you needed Jared to be, which is good because we've been talking about how recently it's looked like he's been a little bit tired. It had been a while since we had one of those really impactful games. Um, so it, it was nice to see him I, step up in that way. I think it's kind of representative of like, you know, how you don't need, um, you know, virtuoso play to get <laughs> Jared going. You need to run towards the rim pretty, pretty aggressively with the ball and just shovel him the ball and he will mm -hmm. eat, you know? Uh, so like, I, I thought he, I thought, you know, uh, again, like much like Okoro's small night uh, was kind of symptomatic of some of their offensive issues. Like Jarrett just getting to to feast on on those kind of those kind of Karis dump offs kind of shows you know just how important that rim pressure is. And you know I just feel like they've I think they've missed Donovan so much more than they have in the past uh, yes. because because of that you know that lack of rim pressure. Um, uh, you know, I think they mix, miss Max on that front, frankly. Um, they do. They uh, miss him, and, and as I said earlier, Mobley as well. Yeah, so uh, it's one of those things where it, it's just, again, it's just been such a weird post-All-Star break. They're 7-9 and nine in the 16 games, and, you know, the fact they've played 16 games in, like, a month, you know, like, they are <laughs> yeah. they are moving, man. Um yeah. But you know, in less than a month, dang, that's crazy. Uh, I think the when, when you consider like yeah. Darius and Evan missed fourteen games uh, with, with their injury over From, like six weeks, right? Yeah. Like that, that really kind of puts it in perspective. And obviously, you know, the the trip to Paris had some impact on that. And, and maybe, and you know, like maybe there is just a degree of like a lot of these mistakes just are like maybe there are a little bit of fatigue mistakes. Maybe guys are just a little worn down. You know, we talked about that with Jared a little bit. Um, but you know, everyone's tired, you know, and, uh, that they, they are, you know, they're giving up ground right now. Uh, you know, a yeah. team like the Knicks who are just as beat up as one four in a row. And mm -hmm. like, you know, I guess this is kind of what we probably had in mind when Darius and Evan went down in December, that this would be the kind of uneven play we would see. And, you know, yeah. they pleasantly surprised us. So it makes it tougher when, when you are seeing it happen in real time. But like, you know, I, I just, again, we just want to see this team close well, and they're just not doing it right now. Yeah, and we're, we're going to get into the, the closing time uh, question because that was definitely something that was present in our the questions we received uh, when we asked uh, for some mailbag, and I'm interested to get into that with you. Um, I should mention uh, as well, you know, Darius didn't shoot particularly well, but I liked his game um, for the most part against Miami. I thought it was another kind of step in the right direction. Uh, you know, seven of 18 from the field, but nine turnovers to, to one assist, or nine assists to one turnover. Nine I'd turnovers still rather see him goal. have high volume nights. You know, I want him to lead the team and shoot in shots. I want him to be aggressive and and pull the trigger. So yeah, I mean, he's had a couple rough shooting nights in a row. I'm just not as worried about that. I believe in, the, especially the three point shot is going to be just fine and dandy. Um, but it, yeah, I just never want to see him fade away. Yeah. It, it, it was much more assertive. Um, 
it's funny. I, I noticed this against Caleb Martin, and I, I think there's been other examples recently where he's kind of been dancing on the perimeter and he probably has enough space for the step back and he's just not taking it. And it's funny to bring this up like when, when you consider, okay, he's leading the NBA and made three since the break. He took 12 tonight, so uh, like 12 or last night. So 12 of his 18 shots came from three. So it kind of feels like a little weird to be like, hey, you should, should have taken more threes. Well, if you're, not, if, you, if you're not successfully pressuring the rim, then you need to successfully pressure elsewhere. I think that is probably the reason that it feels that way. Yeah, I'd like to see more of those step back attempts because he's had guys on him where I felt like, hey, you're going to be able to, you know, generate that that step back three here. And he just hasn't taken it. And it's kind of led to more dribbling and, you know, kind of the the meandering into the, the three point arc that doesn't always necessarily generate a good shot. Um, so on nights where things are getting a little bit stagnant, I'd like to see him do that. Like, I, I think that's one thing that Donovan does really well is even when take some screw it threes yeah like when he's getting walled off and he's not able to kind of get to the rim like he normally does there are times where it's like all right well if this is what's available to me i'm going to take enough threes that you're going to have to change how you're defending me and and hopefully that's going to open up other opportunities so i'd like to see just a little bit more of that uh, but I did think it was noteworthy that with his uh, 12 three-point attempts last night, Darius has now had more games with double-digit three-point attempts than he did all of last season. Uh, obviously, he's played fewer games. Uh, that's seven this year to, to six last year. He did take 10 uh, in his All-Star season, but you know, you're know you definitely seeing that, that volume be there since the All-Star break. And I wouldn't be surprised if almost all of those games have come <laughs> since the break. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna do a count while you while you set up our next segment because now I'm curious. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think the the three point volume is there. I think it's it's weird because uh, even though he's playing better in the way we want him to play, there are still these kind of random nights where it just doesn't feel very impactful. You know, uh, that it, it's the, not, the, it hasn't all come together for sure. Yeah. yeah. So like overall, I think. This current version of Darius just really benefits from Donovan. Um, yeah. You know, and it's really hard having Donovan not there because Donovan can do all the things that aren't quite clicking for Darius right now um, mm-hmm. and allow Darius to be, you know, like uh, like people often talk about the Conley comp, you know, like the the, yeah. the, 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 the the good shooting, get everyone into our offense guy that doesn't make a lot of mistakes. Like in some of his best games of the year, that were a little lower volume where that that's kind of what I saw from him, you know? Um, yeah. uh, and he just hasn't really had the opportunity to do that as much. Um, and has, <laughs> he just kind of has to be a, tw- you know, it, it's just, I feel like two years ago before Donovan was here, he just didn't have a lot of 12 point nights and he's had quite a few of those, uh, yeah. as of late and, uh, nights where it just qu- hasn't quite clicked. Yeah, he, he he simply hasn't been himself, and, and I know he did say post game recently that he's still not at a hundred percent, and he's working his way back. But um, I I definitely think that I thought he, he feel- was there, and you know, with that Phoenix the Phoenix game followed by the New Orleans game, you're like, oh baby, there we I go. Think it was actually after I think it was actually after the Phoenix game. It was either after Phoenix or New Orleans. Where I, I think it was Phoenix, where he said that he wasn't feeling like himself still, even though he he did have a good game in that one. Um, but you know, you definitely feel the absence of Donovan Mitchell. And I think you also like feel the absence of Evan Mobley too, because when Darius is giving the ball up, I feel like he knows where to relocate and how to play off of Mobley better than almost anybody. Like we we have three years of those guys, like having that strong connection, knowing where each other want to be, you know, and when you build a relationship like that over years, beautiful things that can happen just like the last seven years we have gotten terrific support from zoom support for this podcast and the following message comes from zoom half a million businesses connect using zoom a single platform for phone chat workspaces events apps and video zoom enables real-time collaboration for teams on the globe zoom how the world connects we were on zoom before they sponsored us that's how much we love zoom (laughs) <laughs> it's been seven strong years uh with zoom uh jumping into the mailbag um carter your biggest fear came true today where where we put it out on twitter and we did not get a response thankfully the discord you came scumbags. through with some questions but it turns out noon 
on the first day of March Madness is not the time where people are checking Twitter to ask questions to two random podcasts. Can I tell you Ooh, how, how myopic my stupid worldview is these days that I didn't know? <laughs> I didn't know it was the first day of March Madness. I am so... I I was talking to uh, to, to uh, someone online and they were, they were getting ready to have a kid and they were like, man, I'm worried. I'm so busy right now. And, uh, and like, now I'm going to have a kid and that's going to be crazy. And I, I came to like this, like this, like light bulb realization about what my life has become, which is that everything I really care about, like the calves, like this podcast, I make time to do, I make sure I'm, I'm it, it's a part of my life. The friends I really care about, I make sure I still talk to them, but everything I only kind of like gone. <laughs> <laughs> March Madness, March Madness falls gone. <laughs> I, I used to really enjoy it. I have I won't. I probably won't watch a second. You know, it's just one of those things. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I didn't even, didn't even occur to me that that might be a problem. Well, the good news, Carter, is you know, Cavs do have a first round pick this year. Adam Spinella, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to have him because yeah, this he got sucks. hired up by the. Well, who am I yeah, supposed? Got... Who am I supposed to read? Well, the good news is. I am so far perfect on my bracket. So you, you can just interview me. I mean, I haven't watched any. I, I picked based on vibes, but uh, obviously I know my stuff. So yeah, there clearly. You go. clearly. <laughs> so I will be our draft expert. It's okay. I've got us. Um, let's start this off with uh, Mason. Uh, smart, smart fan. Uh, good buddy in our Discord. Uh, a Patreon OG as well. Uh, his question is, do you feel the team has a problem recovering or rotating to the corners? Uh, and corners and, and wings yeah. when the big show high ish from the corners guy sag off to help you you read this carter I'm, yeah you I'm, really I'm struggled with this one buddy do you feel like this team has a problem recovering and rotating to the corners and wings when the big show high ish and the corner guys have to sag off and help or do you think this is just a necessary evil if they're not going to play drop coverage there was yes. a two missing in there and it threw me off yeah i know buddy it's okay uh <laughs> Uh, I think the answer is yes. It is an inherent necessary evil, but I would argue the Cavs do a pretty darn good job of closing out to the corners. Like this is one of these things where this has been kind of our big, this has been our fight for the past couple years is everyone when the Cavs lose talks about how many open threes they gave up. And then you mm -hmm. look at where they st sit in every, in every league ranking and they're typically pretty darn good at uh, not allowing a tremendous amount of threes. Now, the corner threes, if I remember last year, I don't have the numbers from this year because I'm a, I'm a bad podcaster and didn't look it up. Um, is it, But I remember they were like just okay at allowing corner threes last year. Um, and so I do think that is a natural byproduct of, of playing, you know, the help and recover defense that they do play when they aren't just switching. And by the way, you have to, you can't just switch when you don't have the double big lineup, it, it gets mm -hmm. a lot harder, especially since the Cavs are pretty small everywhere else on the floor most of the time. Like, you don't want Jared Allen consistently switching out to point guards and leaving George Niang as your rim protector. Like, that's that's not a recipe for consistent success defensively. So you have to do the help and recover stuff because the Cavs also don't really have the best personnel for drop coverage when they're fully healthy. Like, Isaac is great at it. Um, so like maybe this current iteration, the Cavs can play it, but like, it's just asking a lot of a small frame point guard, like Darius to chase around a corner and stay connected to the back hip of the guard and affect their shot in a meaningful way that allows them to keep two on the ball and not bring a third. I just don't think that's what the personnel needs, you know? Um, and, and like, you know, like, the Bucks, for example, last year, even though you know they even they got burned by it, but that was a perfect drop team. You know, you could have mm -hmm. Giannis playing free safety. You could have uh, Brooke Lopez being seven two and just, just walking backwards. And you had Drew Holiday and Javon Carter, who are absolute insane people, uh, chasing guys around the screen. The Cavs, at their best, are going to be playing guys who that's not really their best way of staying playing defense they, they really need to stay in front of their guys or get help you know get a hedge and recover so 
Mm-hmm. I, I think it is a natural byproduct of their personnel. I think it's the right way for them to play most of the time. You could argue in certain matchups that they would be better off dropping, uh, and mm-hmm. spe- and in per- and certain lineup personnels dropping. But like, you just can't say we're going to help and we're never going to give up corner threes. Uh, yeah. th- th- those are incongruous statements. So yes, Mason, I think they are a-, a necessary evil, but I think the Cavs do as good of a job as any team in the league at mitigating the limitations of their scheme. I agree with that. I would add, um, I'll yes and for you here. I would say that I think it hasn't been as strong lately. Like, I, I think there's been more miscommunications when it comes to kind of helping off the corners. And, and just in general, like, I, I see them give up an open three and really be communicating with one another. Um, you'll you'll hear it sometimes in the halftime interview where they'll mention, hey, we're, we're giving up a, a few too many of those. There's miscommunications in those scenarios. So I don't think it's been as sharp, and some of that might be attributed to, you know, the injuries that they've had, not... I was about to I was about to yes and your yes and by saying a lot of their best players at, at playing this way aren't around <laughs> right yeah, now. And and there's not as much lineup continuity too, right? So like so often we talk about chemistry and continuity when it comes to kind of that second nature feel where guys are going to be offensively. The same thing is true on, on defense. You know, like you you know the tendencies of the guys that you're going to be playing with. Obviously, you have stronger defensive personnel when uh, it's Evan Mobley out there. Like you're going to have more of these lapses. And I think one of the reasons you, you were correct in, in kind of highlighting the Bucks, and we were talking about this in, in the Discord, which was kind of just the difference in terms of the three-point volume that the, the Budenholzer Bucks gave up versus the Cavs. And while DH mentioned, uh, I think correctly, just the ability for Mobley and Allen to cover so much space and kind of their defensive versatility. You just get more scheme it... versatility. You don't just right. have to play help and recover. You get to switch. Like, getting yes. the switch is very valuable, especially with good switch defenders in those guys. Like, they're just not able to right now. And they're yeah. with, without because they don't even have Dean Wade out there, who is a, you know, a more mobile. He's not a rim protector, per se, but he's certainly a more mobile and stronger defender than, you know, a guy like George Niang. So, like, they just don't get to. And that is really rough. Yeah. So from a scheme standpoint, I love the Cavs defensive scheme. I, I think what they're doing is correct. I just don't think that, you know, whether it be personnel, whether it be execution, hasn't been as strong lately. The defensive numbers are still great, but we'd like to talk process over results. And I, I think that's one of those spots where, you know, it just hasn't been as strong for understandable reasons. Um, next question from Reese. What are the biggest developments that you think are not injury related this year? Who's added to their game in a way that translates to a lower volume role? For example, I'm pleasantly surprised that George has found his footing a little bit, and I think it'll pay dividends even when he transitions back to that eighth or ninth man role. Uh, well, I guess I'll just take Reese's answer and say I think George Niang is playing a lot better, and that's important. Um, uh, you know, he is uh, overexposed right now, I think. The Cavs kind of... You know, again, so much of this comes down to versatility and lineup matchups and, and situational matchups. And right now, every important minute the Cavs play pretty much has got to have George on. And like, mm-hmm. you know, like he's a specialist. Um, and I, so I think I think in that way, um, it's important uh, in terms of other developments that I think are really important that are not injury related. Um, you know, it's guys making the most of the opportunities they have. You know, Merrill comes in, has another good game. Uh, and, you know, has kind of refound his footing after uh, one of the slumpiest slumps you'll see a guy have that is that good at shooting. Um, uh, guys like Dean Wade. Um, but, yeah, I want to hear your answer. I'm, I'm just kind of picking all the all the potentials right now. My answer, and it's funny because he's not currently active, I think it's Max Struess. Um, all the time that he's played this season where he's had to be almost a, a lead initiator or one of the primaries, um, whether it be, you know, as a result of, of Darius and Donovan, sometimes both being out of the lineup, obviously, you know, Ty Jerome, Ricky Ruby, all those situations. I think his growth as a playmaker and those stretches of times where he's been asked to do too much are going to help translate the situations when he's, you know, 
and everybody's healthy when he, they're in the more normal role. I, I think the advancements that he's made in his game really help make him that well-rounded, all-around glue guy that the Cavs need to complete a lot of their lineups. And you're right. Like, I, I think, obviously, Donovan and Evan are, are going to get the, the most of the attention when it comes to, hey, the, the Cavs are missing these guys. But I really do think that everything that Max Drew brings to the table is is being missed right now for the Cavs. Like, I, I just think he is such a floor raiser and I, his ability to raise the floor in the ways that he has this season really surprised me, right? Like when people talk about that, that stretch, um, you know, the, uh, I, I think, it, you know, the 14 games that Darius and Mobley missed, you forget that it started with three and one with Donovan also being out, right? Like that, that stretch that they had where it was no Darius, no Donovan, no Evan, and they just found a way to win. And Max was so important, you know, absorbing volume in those minutes and the playmaking that he did. He's a floor raiser, but I, I think when everybody's healthy, the growth he made in those areas is going to help raise the ceiling of this team. Yeah, and uh, one final development, I think uh, that, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit, but I just pulled up the numbers because I was curious. Uh, you know, Karras is playmaking. Um, you mm. know, this guy's averaging, you know, putting up 12 assists every other game uh, in a way that, like, you know, I know not all assists are created equal, but at some point the numbers just are speak for themselves. And, like, his interior passing has got, gone up another level. Um, uh, he is averaging nearly a full assist for 36 minutes better than his career best. Uh, his previous career best was uh, 5.9 uh, in in, uh, in 21. Uh, he's up to 6.7 for 36 with only two turnovers for 36. Wow. Like that is quite, quite the ratio for a guy who is much more known as a scorer and play finisher than a play creator. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think he's having a really, really nice year playmaking and, um, on nights where De you know, like we've talked a little bit about how, you know, he kind of helped bring that rim pressure. Like once the team's fully healthy, you know, uh, knock on wood, hoping we get to see that uh, before the end of the year uh, that, you know, he can provide that supplementary rim pressure. And I, I hope he can continue to do that and be that, be that person who um, kind of forces the action a little bit and, and, uh, and, continues to play that role not just when he's press ganged into it yeah i i, I think that's a great answer and man, he's he's been really helpful for the cast like he, he's been especially in the stretch like the indiana game he got us back in that game he got us back in the miami game i know the the late game i wasn't happy with it but you know you gotta you can't just look at, at the bad and let that outweigh the good. I, I think what he's done this season absolutely uh merits him being in the that conversation for six man of the year. Uh Joe asks, there's 30 teams in the NBA, 16 make the playoffs, two win their conference, one wins the finals. Thanks, Joe. Wherever the <laughs> wherever the offseason begins for the cast, how do you define success for a team that has struggled to reach expectations that have been set by the team stakeholders? I would somewhat take issue with that. Um, uh, that that last sentence. I don't know if they've struggled to 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 reach expectations. Like, you know, unless you're only counting last season as the as the line of demarcation, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but like, even then, like their goal was make the play, you know, avoid the play in at the beginning of the year. They just happened to play so well that we adjusted expectations for them mid year. Um, yeah. You're talking would, about last year, right? Yes, which is okay, and we should do that. But like, you know, it's just it's just tough to say like, uh, you know, they 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 haven't been able to you know consistently reach expectations when you know every step they have made it further along, every step they mm -hmm. have exceeded their preseason expectations. Um, you know, I would say that going into this season our expectations were for them were you really got to win a playoff series last yeah. year going into the year. It was, we, they really should try to avoid the play in. Um, they did that last season. Uh, the way they lost in the playoffs kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But like, I just, again, I would just challenge the framing of that question a little bit because I mm -hmm. actually don't think they have struggled to reach those expectations. Uh, in some cases, in that specific regard, they've almost been the victim of their own success. Like they've outplayed their expectations on the way to the end of the season 
and we've been forced to adjust our uh, uh, adjust them. This season, I think it's actually been very static. No matter how good they've been or how bad they've been, been you know, at any stretch of the year, even when they you know won eighteen out of twenty, I think for the most part, everyone's like, "Well, you better win a playoff series," and I think yeah. that's still true. Uh, and that is how I would probably define at least a baseline success, especially with where they are in the standings. I think it would be very, very disappointing to be the two seed or the three seed and uh, which I still expect them to hold on to unless, you know, proven otherwise mm-hmm. to, to be the two, three, two or the three seed and lose in the first round. I think that would constitute a disappointing season. I think how, successful it is if you get to the second round depends on how that series goes you know uh and and what seed you are frankly because how how you perform against a milwaukee versus how you would perform against a a boston the second round i think you're just kind of playing two different ball games there and and you're gonna have to be a little more nuanced with how you evaluate that success yeah i almost wonder because joe put when whenever the offseason begins for the Cavs. Like, I almost wonder if we misinterpreted this question and, and, you know, this was me not doing follow-up where I should have just to clarify what the question is. My, to not answer the question, because I thought you you did a really thorough job there, to not answer the question, but answer it with a question of my own. I'm curious what happens from an evaluation standpoint if the Cavs do come up short of those expectations. Like, if they do fall in the seedings beyond what, what we kind of, anticipate here and and, you know you they don't achieve their goal of a first round series like what does that mean if like donovan and evan worst case scenario don't play until the playoffs right like what that's the thing that that would just (laughs) suck by the way if if we don't get a chance to evaluate the team's best shot um in what feels like an important evaluation year like that would just be such a bummer you know because like i know the team wasn't fully healthy it going into that postseason uh, against the Knicks, but like we at least had this, everyone. This would be a different level. This would be yeah. a different level, and like I just don't want the data to be useless. And you know, like that would that would be really rough. Yeah, it, it would go back to what you like to talk about, which is what lessons do you choose to learn? Like what, how much importance do you put on that? And honestly, like I think a lot of the evaluation would come down to one-on-one conversations with players. Like what did work? What didn't work? Um, like how are you guys feeling about this? Because that is a collaborative process. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is as much as this is an important season, you brought this up before, like in terms of contract decisions that need to be made, it's Isaac Okor, right? Like you do at least have that as, as something in your back pocket. So I, if the worst were to occur, I'd be interested to see how they approach this based on such an incomplete sample. But like, you know, in terms of the question as it was written, wherever the off season begins, kind of like that impacts whether or not they met expectations because if the off season begins for the Cavs after a hard fought second round series where you know maybe the first round was a little tougher than you expected because guys weren't fully all the way back and we, we've had the injuries and whatnot but they ultimately win and have a great second round series like you're going to feel pretty good about that and the future of the team from there at least I will maybe, yeah. maybe not everyone in the fan base will but I will the royal you me i i will feel good and, and i'm the most important yeah the, uh, the i was going to say that is not what the royal you means <laughs> <laughs> the royal well, you means everyone <laughs> i i know it does i know but for me i am everyone i i'm i am royal in my own mind you're damn uh, right you are buddy you're the 15 are, minute man <laughs> Speaking of 15 minutes, let's see if we can answer this last question within 15 minutes. Uh, Our boy Waji asks, what do you think is the biggest problem with the late game execution for the Cavs? And do you see a fix? Carter, I will jump into this uh, first because I've done some research as I often do when it comes down to these questions. Uh, We mentioned on the last podcast that the Cavs did have the best record in the NBA uh, by games decided by five or fewer points. We also talked a little bit about the clutch time stats uh, with the NBA and some of the issues when you're looking at just kind of that landing page uh, that NBA.com has uh, to clarify, if you were trailing by four 
uh, with, you know, 455 left in the game and the other team, you know, hits a bunch of threes and wins by 15, that would go down as a clutch loss because you were within five at some point in the last five minutes. So I reduced the sample a little bit here because I think two minutes to go within five points, I think as fans, that's kind of what we internalize as, you know, that's clutch time. That That's, you know, when, when games are won or lost. Uh, right now, this season, the Cavs, when they're within five points, when they're t- either tied or leading by five or fewer points, they are 17 and four. Uh, that is the m- six most wins in those situations this year, uh, trailing the Nuggets, Bulls, Celtics, Lakers, and Bucks. Um, when they are trailing by five or fewer or tied, they are eight and 13. So some note that if you're tied, this is that result is going to show up in both columns. Uh, but that is the fourth most wins when within five points with two minutes to go, trailing just the Bulls, Lakers, and Kings. Now, the thing that I found really interesting with these sample sizes, Carter, is when it comes to the actual offensive rating and defensive rating in these spots, we, from a result standpoint, are outperforming our record. Or, or like we're outperforming our net ratings because those are great records, like 17 and four, eight and 13 in those spots. That's what you want to see. But we're 22nd in offensive rating and 18th in defensive rating when we're either tied or leading. And we are 15th in offensive rating and 20th in defensive rating when we are tied or trailing. So we're getting the end results, but that discrepancy might account for why it doesn't feel as good and and why, you know, some fans have concerns because, you know, it doesn't feel good even when we win. And we do have some of those losses where, you know, the offense and defense isn't up to the cast standards in those moments. Awesome research. Um, And it kind of undercut a point I was going to make, which is that I think, I think that late game feels bad for everyone. That, that is, that is, that is a, I think a general truth. I don't think Mm -hmm. anyone is like, like, I just don't think almost any teams are consistently running great offense because late game is the closest thing to the playoffs when teams are, really allowed to play very physically. They are pulling and grabbing and mucking up your sets. They're not letting you walk into a high pick and roll. You know, they're going to, they're going to do everything to make it ugly. Um, Mm -hmm. I think the Cavs having smaller guards makes that even harder because, you know, you can just rough them up a little bit more, Um, uh, especially in terms of them coming to the ball. Uh, they they get beat up a little bit more, um, but you know I I do think the the incongruousness of the fact that their net ratings aren't that good but their results are that does match my eye test. You know, like I I think mm-hmm. that you know I've set only four losses when you're you, when you're leading between zero and five points with two minutes left to go in the game. That's really good, and like that yeah. does match. You know, that doesn't match what people might say, which is that they blow, you know, blow winnable games all the time. You know, I went on a big rant on the first half of this podcast about poor decision making leading to several losses that they should have won. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not (laughs) because they only have (laughs) lost four of those uh, all year. Um, And then on the other side, eight and 13, quite, quite good. Also, uh, another, you know, and and a good indicator that, you know, they they are staying competitive and that also matches my eye test that they're never out of games. They 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 fight and they fight and they fight and they fight. And I think actually those numbers might even be skewed a little bit by how much they fight, you know, down eight points with two minutes, three minutes left to go. They're not gonna just they they're not doing there aren't a lot of games where that balloons up to twenty. Like they yeah. typically stay in and get it close and then just run out of gas at the end. In terms of the process, I think defensively i think they do quite well i think that defensive rating is is skewed by a small sample because i think their scheme is typically quite good i think they typically have the right personnel out there and guard very very well they guard without fouling they guard um you know i think mostly they make smart decisions offensively i do think it's a lot of that it's it's either you know when they're fully healthy it's a Sometimes they have a little lack of trust 
in their in their offense and will will you know overly rely on on iso ball and my turn your turn stuff and then when they're beat up i think some of their limitations just get really really magnified so Mm -hmm. i don't know if i have a a fix um and like you know the results would tell you they don't need a fix but the 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 ratings kind of tell you otherwise so i think my fix is run stuff run pick and roll get into your sets quickly uh slip on switches to to gain an advantage trust trust in what in your offense by committee team that you do have where yeah. everyone where you have four or five guys that you trust to make decisions consistently i think sometimes that trust gets pared down late in games and like it's natural i think that's every team but i think the cavs have less margin for error for that trust to go away they don't have a luka doncic who can just by sheer elite freaking talent generate a nine a nine out of ten look just by being yeah. himself. Like they just don't have that. They don't have a Jokic. They don't have a Doncic who are you know the most elite playmaker and isolation score combos in 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 the league. They have to work. They have to trust a process, or it's just not going to play for them. Yeah, I I agree with all that. Um, You know, it's worth noting, this is a 51 minute sample, Um, like for for both of these combined, like it's a 51 minute sample, which, you know, makes sense. You're you're talking about 30 games last two minutes. Um, It it can only be a maximum of 60. Um, But and and that's just that's this is the this is the problem with any analysis that you're always going to have to kind of rely. And I'm sorry to interrupt again, but. Yeah. I feel like it's one of those things where you have to just rely on your basketball belief system a little bit because just like the playoffs, you're not going you're never you're not gonna be allowed to gather a sample that is meaningful enough to evaluate. You have yeah. to just trust what you believe in and trust what we- your eyes are giving you with a little bit of numbers sprinkled in, but you can't just be like well, the lineup data says because fifty minutes that, that is was nothing. one of my biggest. That was one of my biggest gripes with, with Houston, right? Like uh, the, the James Harden, Daryl Morey Rockets, where it's like, oh, you know, we took twenty seven threes, but the the shot luck wasn't there. Like you have to kind of acknowledge, you know, the the human component of this. Like, all right, this isn't dropping. Let, let's get guys more touches. Let's get something going to the basket, right? And you're like, just not going to get the data to be proven right. You don't have the yeah, sample to be proven right. A playoff series is too small of a sample to count on things normalizing you have to kind of make those decisions on the fly and um i definitely think a big factor of this is you know when your offensive engines are six three and six one respectively like there's things defenses can do to them that makes things difficult and i think your point of you know making sure that you are running offense um not being predictable in those spots really does make a difference and that you know that was one of my first conclusions that's always going to be one of your issues when you have smaller guards. That's why we've talked in the past about how important it is to have the playmaking of Evan Mobley and Jared Allen and, and now Max Struess, um, because you need to have those front court guys. Like um, Toronto won a championship with Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet playing a lot of minutes at 5'11", because you know you had Marcus All, you had Kawhi Leonard, you had these front court playmakers. Um, but the other thing that I, I kind of thought about was well, how much have Darius and Donovan been playing together when it comes to this? And you can't filter lineup data to clutch time. But what you can find is that, you know, Garland and Mitchell have only played 156 minutes total in fourth quarters this season. They have a plus 22 net rating wow. in those minutes. Plus 22, uh, a one, uh, 119 offensive rating and a 97.4 defensive rating. That's outstanding. Um, You know, people have talked about the viability of closing with the core four. Garland, Mitchell, Mobley, and Allen in fourth quarters this year have only played 49 minutes together total. 49 Ah. minutes together total all season. They have a plus 28.8 net rating in those minutes. Like, that's outstanding. That that is out of this world good. I I wish it didn't make me sad (laughs) because the number is so low. (laughs) And, and like, even if you look, okay, because the number is so low, does that mean that they were bad last year? No. Well, last year in fourth quarters, uh, they had a plus 17 net rating together as a, a core four. 
Uh, last year, Garland and Mitchell in 394th quarter minutes had a net rating of yeah, n- n- plus 19.7. Plus 19.7 in fourth quarters over a 400 minute sample in fourth quarters last year. That's insane. Like these guys are so good together um, and really do make it harder for defenses to, you know, key in on one or the other. I do think like when you look at fourth quarters, if you want to ask like the tendencies and flaws of, of our individual guards, I think Darius gets rushed a few too many times. So right. Like Allen missed that lob dunk, but I think Darius also threw it a little too high because high. he was excited. He made the play. Right. Um, There's been but, a few threes where he, he, you know, got way too much leg underneath him too. Right. And, you know, the deep three that he took against Miami, I think he only took one shot kind of in the, those moments. I, I thought was actually, you know, a confident good shot that just didn't yep. drop. Um, but I, I think that that is where Darius needs to improve and where he needs to grow individually. Donovan, I think things slow down too much. and He doesn't involve other guys on, on the court. He gets a little bit too ISO heavy. Um, even though I can't look at the lineup data with both of them on the court, I can look at individual team offensive ratings with both of them on and, and this season uh in Darius's minutes they do have a 111 offensive rating which would be 11th uh in, in the NBA uh, among teams uh, which goes to your point of teams don't get good offense in general uh in these crunch situations uh but they do have a, a negative 9 net rating overall so the defense has kind of really let them down in those Darius uh minutes uh Donovan in his kind of clutch time, even though his individual uh, statistics are a little bit better than Darius, the Cavs have a 95.2 offensive rating in those minutes, which I, I think goes to show like that things have been a little bit stagnant in those minutes and they haven't necessarily been generating those looks. So I do think one of the fixes is just everyone being healthy, right? Like getting both guards together, having, I know people don't want to close with two bigs, but I really do think like Mobley and Allen to, together, like having those options to go to the playmaking, both of them provide um, can obviously plug holes on the defensive end and help you close out some of these games that you're up five. And, you know, there might be playoff situations where you do sit one or the other uh, because you're trying to get offense going, but having both of those options, I think is important. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, thank you for all this research. It's freaking great. Um, sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll do this homework and I'll be like, yeah, that, that all seems right. But like, I think finding all these little incongruous spots really does let us live in the gray, you know, of this, uh, of how we analyze these post, these late game things. Like, you know, I think while also still living in fact, um, so, uh, I pre- really appreciate you finding that because it's really interesting because yeah, their process could improve. Um, and yeah, they do have some limitations, but also, you know, their results speak for themselves. On, on the other hand, like they are a better close game team than anyone wants to give them credit for right now. Yeah. I, I mean, no one's going like no one would believe you if you told them that the Cavs were the best fourth quarter team in the league last year. No, but they they were by net rating. Right. Like and, and when you're dealing with a 51 minute sample here too, like little things like, oh, Darius created multiple open threes for George and he just missed two of them. Like if one of them goes in over a 51 minute sample, that wildly skews the, everything, right? Like uh, Terry, uh, you know, the the seven points that he got there, that likely skewed when, when I talk about, oh, you know, Darius is closing minutes. Uh, they're, they're getting hurt on the defensive end. A lot of that defensive rating could have been heavily skewed just by last night's game because yep. this was all pulled today. So it's, it's it. something to keep in mind. But I, I think the most important thing is from a process standpoint. And I think when you talk about how the Cavs roster is constructed, as much as there's the element of, hey, for 32 minutes, one big, one guard, we, we have that. As much as that is kind of a core part of the team building philosophy of this team, its viability at the highest level does require all of them together. Two bigs works offensively if both guards are healthy and in the lineup. It doesn't work as well offensively if it's only one of the guards and two of the bigs, right? Like it's they do all need to be healthy for this to work. And I think you know talent when you talk important. About, 
talent is really important. It really, really, truly is. So I, I think we're just hoping that, you know, that's available by playoff. Cross your fingers, but the Cavs are, are in a fight, man. Like, they got this Minnesota game. They play Miami again uh, on the road. That's going to be tough. Like, you got to rack this... up some wins here. You just do. You know, New York is coming. They're, they're you know, they're fighting with Denver tonight. Uh, the Bucks are, 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 you know, at home against the Nets with Giannis back. Like, you know, you, you just don't want to give up ground. You just don't want to drop into that four or five. So, and, and you might not want to mess with Orlando. My God. Yeah, 42 and 28. Great. That's got to be, by the way, that's got to be the the most insane story in the league and that no one's talking about. This team is Didn't nasty. They do that last year? Didn't they do that last year? Like their last 40 games? Like Yeah, they, they were, were better. And, but that what's so weird is they start the year gangbusters. They were like the three seed at one point uh, in the first like two months of the year. And then they fell back to earth and everyone's like, okay. That was cute, but now it's time to get real with them, and they're going to be a fringe play-in team, and that's cool. And then they're like, actually, no. We're going to win the Southeast Division. <laughs> they're 42-28. and 28. <laughs> They're pretty damn good. They, it, they very well this, might man. hold on to home court advantage in the first round, which is or, – or get to home court advantage in the first round. They're tied with the Knicks right now in terms of uh, in terms of games back. They're one back in the loss column. But, like, you know, if the Knicks lose uh, to, tonight, the the – uh, the Magic will will be, have the four seed. It's bananas, dude. They're playing oh, so of well. All, first of all, Knicks, please lose tonight. Denver, take care of business. Uh, yeah, man, <laughs> I, I would like I would like to get that that two games in, in the loss column uh, advantage back. Because, um, like I said uh, on uh, the previous podcast this week, if there's a spot where the Cavs get caught, it's this week, and then yeah. you're going to have to go kind of earn that back. So. Um, big, big, important week for the Cavs. Uh, you know, reinforcements probably aren't coming anytime soon, so they're going to have to find ways to win. Hopefully, Dean Wade can at least come back. He seems like the, the first to return. Um, but, man, the, the guys they have are, are going to have to earn it. I, I think, overall, there's a lot you can, positive you can take from Miami and, and the win over Indiana. Um, but they're going to need to... You got to string wins to together. You can't... They've, yeah. they've won uh, more than one game in a row only once uh, since the All-Star break. And we're, we're back to January of last year. We're, we're, we're rotating wins and losses, yeah, and that just never pong, feels ping good. Ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. And like the, where the Cavs want to be, you can't be that. You can't play 500 ball for, you know, over a month for, or, you know, for more than a month. So they got to mm-hmm. string wins together, which means with where they are, uh, from a health perspective, it means stealing some games they shouldn't steal um and uh and just you know and not letting up and finding that focus and and digging that deep in late march is hard to do man so yeah you know I, i'm hopeful i'm rooting for them i really would love them to go in and, and steal one in minnesota uh, in minnesota which is going to be you know an uphill battle they're playing and eh, not as good a ball as they were in the year so maybe you can but uh you know that's you just got you you got to see it yeah yeah, I, I completely agree, man. Oh boy, this is a this is a stressful time. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how the, the Cavs do. You know, fingers crossed. But you, if they if you give away some of these games and, and you don't win the ones that you have to win, you give yourself a, a harder path. Like that's just the the realities and consequences of the NBA. So it'll be interesting to see how they respond, how they close this out. Um, love to get a win in these next two games obviously we'd love to get two uh so we'll see how they do there i can't believe buddy that it's been seven years seven the years big thanks still to you that, still me still here <laughs> big thanks to everyone that, that's been supporting us along the way uh w- whether this is your first episode listening or whether you've been here the full seven years we really do appreciate you uh, obviously a massive thanks to the Cavs as well uh, for letting us be part of their media family these last few years. It's been over three years with them as well, man. Like Banana we, we pancakes. Us, if they keep us around for another year, we might be reach the point where we've been with them longer than we've been, you know, independent on our own. Like that's, that's insane. That just fried like, my it, brain, bro. I'm, I'm not what? ready to think about that. <laughs> that's, that is, that's absolutely nuts, man. Um, but you know, for everyone that support us along the way, all, all the network hopping that we did and, and all the 
the people that have jumped on the podcast as as guests and whatnot we really really do appreciate you guys we appreciate everyone that was tuning in live on youtube make sure you like and subscribe click the notification bell so you know when we're going live if you're listening via podcast and you want to support us leave us a rating leave a review subscribe unsubscribe resubscribe and help cook those books if you want to be part of the chase down's exclusive discord chat send a screenshot that view to chase down at gmail.com however you choose to support us we really do appreciate it make sure you guys are staying safe out there until next time go Cavs. <laughs>